show. And the Lamaistic deities are shown on, on peacocks and it's a powerful, powerful uh, symbol. And again, something interesting. Now she, she passed through the two matrices and what happened, she was reborn, but now the regression continues and now the way is open all the way into the kind of a prenatal state, which in this particular situation takes oceanic form and she's now beco becoming one with different uh, fish, jellyfish, for some people it could be uh, dolphins, whales and so on. So the fetal and the oceanic are both Neptunian states and they're very, very closely, uh, closely related. And here she's coming down. The emphasis is she's grounded, she's connected, connecting to the earth, but the head is in heavens and there are birds, again, as cross-cultural symbols of spiritual liberation. Okay, now we do something else. This was journey of one woman. Now I will show you a number of pictures. Most of them are from psychedelic sessions. And this is, you know, I'm showing this in our training or in workshops um, where we cannot do psychedelics, but we do breathwork. So people do their own breathwork mandalas. So this is why there is really more of the psychedelic imagery, but there will be enough of the breathwork Ex, um, images that you see this, the, the similarity. And we will go in the sequence of the biological uh, order of the of uh, the matrices, which we, we go to the first, second, third, fourth. This is not the way it would happen when you work on it. When you work on it, it can come in any kind of sequence. And there's something that I don't have time to go into, but this was that last point uh, I've worked now for 30 years with Rick, who is a brilliant, Rick Tarnas, is a br brilliant astrologer. And we found out that which matrices you visit in your sessions will reflect the archetypes of your tra transiting planets. And again, you can find on my, on my um, website, you know, this stanislavkrov.com, you can find a, a, about 40 pages paper on how we, how we work with archetypes and astrology. There's also an article from this new journal that's now beginning to appear, where Rick Tarnas is kind of the mastermind behind it. And it's about archetypal psychology and astrology. For those of you who are astrologers, it's called Archai. As the first issue is available now on the web. Uh, okay, so this is this is uh, the experience of a good womb, sort of being in the womb and at the same time experiencing oneself as being in the, in the cosmos. And again, there is this coex layering. If you, are, if you are in a good womb, it's very easy access to being also on the good breast. You can go back and forth or even simultaneously. Both Neptunian experiences, both symbiotic fusion with the mother, both mediated by liquid, by blood on the, on the level of the womb and the milk on the level of the, of the breast. And what you see here is that the galaxy has the form of a breast. And we have it in the language, you know, in uh, Greek you have gala, in uh, Latin you have luck. Galaxy is milky, it's milky way. So here you can see the fetal is also close to the cosmic. We saw the oceanic, now we see the cosmic aspect. This is another, another person. The, the fetal element is a little smaller, but it's, it's essentially the same. And this is now the good womb opening into the oceanic, where you can literally become, become these creatures with deep insights into them. This is not coming from a I don't know if you have Nova programs or the you know, planet, or this is not coming from the television or from movies. You become the, the whale. I mean, you, you get a very specific taste in the mouth, you know, that, 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 that they have, you, can, you can experience the sonar and all those things in dolphins. Okay, this one has both of those elements, or all three. This is a fetus in an oceanic setting and at the same time in cosmos orbiting uh, satellite. 
So this kind of experience would come when you have some strong Neptune as a transit. This is, uh, again, being child in a good womb, and it becomes archetypal. This is like Jung's uh, divine child archetype. This is a, a patient whom I described in uh, the book When the Impossible Happened as Milada. She was psychotic when we started doing the, this. And here she had the experience of being in the good womb, and she opened her eyes and looked at me, and she said, there are no, there's no boundary between us. Uh, actually, I, I know what you are thinking, I know your thoughts. So the research in me said, okay, let's, let's try. And she was in my head, I mean, she, she knew my thoughts. So it was not just that she thought she was telepathic, but she was really, really reading me. I don't know if you can see it. I am on the right side, this kind of the outline, the silhouette, and from her you can see, I think, the eye, two eyes, and then lower the two nipples, and then, then, uh, um, then the legs. Okay, now this is the opposite. This is an episode of a toxic womb. That's several interesting things. Again, this uh, seems mediated by chemistry, okay? If I look at it as a medical doctor, what would be happening is biochemical. It's toxicity in the womb. But here you get a deeper picture. This is not happening independently. There is another level that forms and informs it. These are sort of insidious, demonic archetypes that are creating this situation, and the bridge then is chemistry. Uh, so, so here, there is the realization of the archetypal level that's, that's creating that. And on the other hand, there is also identification with other creatures in a similar predicament, which is like fish in polluted waters and chicken uh, in a very advanced stage of embryogenesis, where there is you know, incredible toxicity inside, because there's no way of getting these, the metabolic side products from the, from the explosive growth. These are the kind of experiences where people become militant ecologists. They, they realize, realize what we are doing, we are polluting, you know, we are polluting the egg in, in, which, uh, uh, in which we live, on which we depend. Uh, we are, you know, we are polluting rivers, we are polluting the air, and you just see that it's insane. It's insane to be a biological creature and destroying your, your vital environment. So you don't have to teach people ecology. This is a hostile womb, I talk about it already. And again, our age incompatibility would be a biochemical problem for us, but that's not enough. You see, there is another level that's sort of uh, creating it, that's, that's expressing itself chemically in the womb. This one was called uh, always hungry, uh, undernourished. And again, you can see the other level, the hunger happens also on the breast. It's a bad, bad womb, bad breast. And this is a really bad womb. Okay. I love this one. This was a sense that there was not enough vitality in the prenatal state. And the way it came out is the fetus is in an electric bulb. And if you look up, there's no access to, to electricity. There's no juice coming into it. Okay. And here we have Giger, you saw Giger visiting Hoffman. So he called this uh, uh, the uterine landschaft, the, the uterine landscape. He has a series of them. He is somebody who was experimenting with, uh, with uh, psychedelics and got in a bad place and uh, has this amazing, amazing ability to express it artistically. So he's the master of the second and the third matrix. So this is when you, when you get in touch with the inside of the uterus, which is sex, birth, okay? And then he puts crosses there. It's a cemetery inside of the uterus, which is now birth, sex, death. And when I show this in Switzerland, men told me this is the shape of the targets which the Swiss army uses for shooting practice. 
So he got also violence there. So it's a very interesting way of uh, working with images. And I told you that I'm now writing this. It's been published a book on Giger, showing how this large cartography gives you deeper understanding of art, of content of art. You know, the, in the tradition of uh, Freud, Leonardo da Vinci, his analysis of Hamlet, uh, Merchant of Venice, Goethe's uh, Dichtung und Wahrheit, and so on. Bo Mari Bonaparte's uh, analysis of Poe. Those were all bio trying to explain it from biography. And so I'm trying to show how you certain certain art you can you cannot understand without expanding the the cartography. This is Carmen, and Carmen did the whole training with us, and uh, they're just dear dear friends. And you can see the size of the of Hans Ruedi's pictures again. And on the left is Rick Tarnas visiting with me. Uh, Alejandro Khodorovsky invited uh, Hans Ruedi to do the art for the Dune. So he, he, this is a furniture for the Harkonnen Castle. And there's a black version of it. So if you come to his house, you sit on this chair and above you are three skulls and around you are you know, ribs and the, the table is sitting on femur and so on. Uh, you're really visiting the matrices there. You can see the inside of the house. Okay, he was, uh, he was uh, as a child, he was just enamored by ghost rides. There was in Hur, where he grew up, they had the uh, kind of an uh, annual mart, and they had a ghost ride. And so he created a ghost ride for the children in uh, the neighborhood. And then as an adult, he still has that passion. So he has this small railroad going through his garden and through the corner of his house and he took me for a ride through this and I'll show you some of the things that you see the very perinatal ride got <laughs> demonic women and, and you know tunnels of course you know. this is where we had the, our module on fantastic art in his uh, in his museum and this is Alex Gray and uh, Alison Gray again great visionary Visionary artists who probably know the sacred mirrors. By the way, I'll take you into really heavy images, and uh, you know, if you don't like it, if you don't like that, I'm saying close your eyes. This is this is actually when he's in a better better days. Excuse me. Now. Uh, you see, I think it's extremely important to know what the psyche is about. As long as we have psychology where the worst thing that can happen is bad nursing or, uh, you know, and even, even physical abuse, we will never understand Nazism, communism, what's happening in, uh, what was happening in Bosnia and so on. So, I mean, this, this process takes you into into the places in the psyche out of which these kinds of impulses come. Now the good news is that there are now technologies that we can go there and we can work with it. We can we can transform it. Okay, those are the. But there are people who don't want to who don't want to see this aspect. They want to look at this aspect. So if you if you really respond very negatively, just close your eyes. But uh, but I think we have to know what we are dealing with before. We can do anything about it. Okay. So this is another vortex, like Harriet Francis. You can think about Edgar Allan Poe. He has a story, a descent into the underworld. You take some other stories: Pit and the Pendulum, uh, Premature Burial, uh, House of Ashes. You know, all those things are powerful. The power of Poe's stories is that he he sort of describes these perinatal images. Okay, so swallowing, being going into the birth process is like whirlpool being sucked in or being swallowed by some archetypal being. Again, you can think about mythologies, Jonas, the great fish, you know, swallowing, retaining and regorging. Uh, Saint Margaret being swallowed by the dragon, Jason being swallowed by the dragon and so on. Heroes' journeys into the into the underworld. Uh, uh, well, you 
know, from Odysseus, Orpheus, and so on. Steppenwolf, uh, you can look at this. So you can see these swallowing. You see that it's related to death. There is a skull. You can see the placenta, where the archetypal image underlying the placenta is the world of life, the very powerful, the very powerful archetypal image. And there we have snakes. We'll see quite a few snakes. Um, if you are Freudians, you know what snakes mean. There's only one meaning. Uh, that's another very imaginative way of working with symbols. Once you get to, to uh, the perinatal level, the vipers represent the, uh, the imminence of death, but also, also uh, initiation. In the Via Dei Mystery that um, Arthur was showing, there was not one picture which you find on the fresco there, a bite by a viper on the, on the forehead and the, and the heel, which is the beginning of the Dionysian rite there on the frescoes. And then the boa constrictor is also perinatal. It swallows the prey and looks like pregnant, but also twists around and crushes. And so it becomes a very meaningful, powerful uh, symbol. Once you get to the transpersonal level, there are any number of meanings to snakes depending on the archetypal domain. So the snake in the Garden of Eden is very different from a snake representing Kundalini. It's very different from Muchalinda, who was uh, protecting the Buddha from, from rain, very different from uh, the plumed serpent Quetzalcoatl, very different from the rainbow serpent of the Aborigines. So if you do this work, you have to have a good Jungian symbol, uh, dictionary, dictionary of symbols to, to know what your snake means. It's not, you know, there's a snake, so it's a penis, not, not a big deal. We have the interpretation right away. Also very interesting now, she's now being swallowed, which is the, you know, this is the archetypal uh, image of the uterus that's now sort of constricting, but now it's creating tremendous discomfort, choking, uh, compression, fear, and it generates enormous amount of aggression. So you can see she is turning now into an evil being. So there is now aggression coming in as well as out. I don't know where we are going to be with, with time, but I have a whole series of cartoons and, uh, and I wasn't planning to do it here, but I have it. Uh, cartoons and posters from the, time, from the time of war. Louder or what? Oh, yeah. Okay. How, how to, how to, countries that are at war portray each other. And you would see again and again the same images that I'm showing. The enemy is an octopus, the enemy is a spider, it's going to swallow you, you know. Pushing the wrong button. Another Giger. So he's really, you know, deep in the perinatal, as, as, as deep as you can go. So if the fetus is, you know, very frail creatures, but this is a, the, the weapons, the, the grenades and the, uh, the submachine guns are illusion to the, to the powerful uh, battle that these, these creatures have to go through. Then they have the, the uh, on the forehead, you know, they have the steel rings for, and he makes them into these pitiful Indian warriors by giving them these uh, uh, feathers. And this is his self-portrait, so you, you see where he is getting his ideas. This was for an exhibition. Okay. And this, this is the kind of art, suffering fetuses, he's really, you know, connecting with them. And this is one of his birth machines, okay, portraying the... This is very interesting. This is, uh, this is called uh, the Stillgeburt Maschine, the stillbirth machine. And it's showing the mother and the child trapped in a situation where they both suffer and there is no way out. And this is basically the situation of the second matrix where now nature puts the mother and the child into an antagonistic situation. The mother is now taking away the comfort of the womb 
causing pain to the child, and the presence of the child is now causing pain to the mother. So it's antagonistic until the cervix opens, and then there is synergy. Then the mother wants to complete the delivery, and the child wants to, wants to in most instances, wants to get out. I've also seen situations where people didn't want to be born, but... So that's a, that's a really interesting picture. I have, I have worked with people who found in the situation deep roots of their hostility towards their mothers. And they didn't like their mother, and they thought that it's because of uh, the mother did to them in a situation where she had a choice. She could, done, she could have loved them and done something different. To find out that, that the mother has to inflict pain just to give birth in itself can be a very, very liberating insight. That, and of course, the, the resolution is to relieve it, to bring it fully into consciousness and, and process it with some other bad wombs. You know. Now, the spiders are coming. Okay, so what about spider? Why should spider be part of the, of the second matrix? Jung, actually, when he was writing, uh, this book that in English is called Symbols of Transformation. The original is Symbole und Wandlung and der Libido, which is the one where he parted with Freud, where he, that libido is not sexual energy, is more like uh, um, Aristotle's Entelechy or, or uh, Henri Bergson, uh, Elan Vital. And he was analyzing this uh, poetry and prose of this uh, Frau or Miss actually Miss Miller, and at one point he comes to the image of uh, the spider. He's finding cross-cultural similarities to images in her poetry. He comes to the spider and he deciphers the spider as the image of the devouring feminine, kind of devouring mother image. Now if you think about the, the spatial aspect of the first matrix, being in the space, uh, unobstructed universe. Uh, you can imagine a, a butterfly or a fly flying in the air. The whole world belongs to it until there is a spider web that terminates that you fly into a spider web and suddenly something closes in and your life is threatened. So the, this is the logic, the experiential logic behind uh, the spider. So people who have arachnophobia are not afraid of the spider out there but they saw what the spider did to the fly, and they somehow started stirring up their own memory that something like that happened to them. And the fear is coming from within. It's not coming from the, from the spider. It's a real arachnophobia. Okay, from a, from a psychedelic session. This is from a breathwork session, so we can see the, you know, the similarities in it. This is from the, from the breathwork training. If you can pay attention to this one, because we'll see the resolution of that. Okay, another LSD session. Mother dragon, okay. And now these two images are not from self-exploration. At a certain point I became interested in the art that people paint uh, when they are on death row, there's a whole big thing on the internet, and uh, there's a business sort of, you know, somewhat perverted. This is a person who knew that he would be executed, uh, like in a few days. So the upper part makes sense. Bars, I mean, he is, you know, he is in a cell, but you see suddenly there is the, there is the spider web, and look at, look at this one. Okay, so the, so his, his image of the, of death is really being drawn from, from the perinatal. Now this is the, like the female reproductive system in the, in the process of delivering. So it becomes like a combination of a prison, of a torture chamber and a, and a um, press, gigantic press. This is Giger. Another th attraction that was in this annual mart was this uh, gadget that sort of measures force. You know, men come there and they hit, and then how high it goes. And in his adult artistic imagination, it became this uh, vagina dentata, the kind of a uh, vagina guillotine kind of a situation. 
if you do this work, you completely uh, rethink and, and uh, reconstruct the basic Freudian concepts. Freud had the idea of vagina dentata, that the vagina with teeth that can kill, that can castrate. And for Freud, this was like the silly fantasy of the little infant that doesn't know better. If you realize that there is a record of birth, it's not that silly, you know. I mean, this is an organ that can be dangerous in one situation, namely when it's delivering you. So then when it's extrapolated, when it's taken into other situations, then it's inappropriate. But in its, in its nature, in its root, that reflects clinical reality. The same Freud's, uh, Freud's idea about the castration complex. He ran into amazing problems with it. It didn't make any sense. Because he found it in women. Uh, and he was talking about the fact that, um, uh, first of all, you know, the penis, the penis is the most important thing in the world. And it's all about having and not having a penis. So uh, Freud's psychology of women is a is psychology of castrated males, basically. <laughs> So his idea was that, that girls believed that they had a penis and they lost it, lost it so they, they were sort of uh, uh, guilt pro, more guilt-prone and more masochistic and so on. And of course the boys are horrified that they might lose it. But then there were things, uh, fear of castration equals fear of death. Well, it's not, not, not great to lose a penis, but it's not, you're not dead yet. You know, Termination, loss of an important relationship activates the castration complex. Where is the connection? And the associations following, associations about castration, which could be like circumcision, you talk about circumcision or operation for phimosis. The next most frequent association is to suffocation. What is the connection between castration and suffocation? So in this work, it would be a coex where there could be something like circumcision and for women, uh, DNC or painful cystitis. But the, the deeper level is the cutting of the umbilical cord. And then suddenly you understand this is what we share, men and women share. It is certainly a loss of an important relationship being severed from your, from your mother. And uh, it's your pi pipeline of oxygen. So if somebody cuts the umbilical cord, you choke. Okay, so but then we'll see a, another picture that illustrates it. Now this is like the whirlpool. This is a termination of the oceanic aspect of the first matrix. Okay, we, we saw the spider as the as the termination of the spatial of the of the cosmic uh, aspect. This is a birth as a fight with a python. Guilt, guilt is a very important thing. You work with people who are consumed with guilt. You think about Kafka, for example. Um, irrational guilt, you don't, know, you don't know that you've done anything that terrible and you feel very, very guilty. Some people feel guilty about even being here, you know, for existing and so on. And if you, if you work with holotropic uh, breathwork or holotropic states, you would find a history of guilt tripping. Your parents, what your parents told you about, you know, if, if you knew how much we sacrificed for you, you couldn't do this for, you know. Uh, I've, I've worked with people where the mother was using labor pain. If, if you know what terrible agony it was to give birth to you, you 